This content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up. Thank you for listening. Hello, everybody out there in Bourbon Real Talk land. Randy Sullivan coming to you with a social distancing kind of recording today. I usually like to be in the same room with my guest, but unfortunately with COVID-19, social distancing, and the fact that you guys are all the way across the country from me, we are doing this on Zoom meetings. So if it's a little bit quiet, I apologize for that. Zoom kind of records a little bit more quiet. Uh, but why don't you gentlemen go ahead and introduce yourselves? Hi, my name is Jeff Haddon. I'm the founder of Soldier Valley Spirits here in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. I'm Rich Hagedorn, Vice President, uh, Marketing, Sales, Bottling, the whole nine yards here at Soldier Valley Spirits. My name is Dave Young. I'm um, the strategist kind of behind the scenes. I dabble with some of the social media work. Well, on this show, this is Bourbon Real Talk, and we like to uh, sip on a little bit of whiskey. It doesn't necessarily have to be bourbon, but we like to sip a little whiskey while we talk. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have the ability to get a hold of any of your product uh, before we started filming. Uh, so I'm just going to drink some uh, horse whiskey. Got a little bit of Blanton's here. You're so. drinking a great bourbon there. I, uh, before this, this life, I was in the liquor spirit wholesale business for a little over 20 years. So um, sold pretty much everything that uh, under the sun. So you guys at Soldier Valley shut down production and started making hand sanitizer. How long ago did that start? It really feels like three or four months. <laughs> <laughs> um, but honestly, yeah, right around, I think this is our third, coming up maybe on our fourth week. Right away, uh, we kind of started getting involved with, with that. So um, it, it seems like a lot longer than that, just because <laughs> there's so many nights and, and uh, you know, you, you started, or you said earlier before we started the recording was, some of the bureaucracy that you have to go through in order to kind of line things up. I, did you completely shut down your regular production and went straight to hand, hand sanitizer? Or are you doing both simultaneously? So we, we shut it down. Um, mm -hmm. It was, it was a decision that I made right away that uh, the need for, for making hand sanitizer was going to be an issue. And I, I, made the decision to go ahead and shut down production, looking to see what it would take to, to create the, the hand sanitizer. Got with these two gentlemen here, put our, our knuckleheads together, and uh, came up with uh, what we, we think is at least the solution for our area of the country, which is you know, right in the middle of the of heartland. So we still kept our wholesaler uh, fully supplied with our products leading up to this, uh, but all the grocery stores, because you can sell spirits in grocery stores here, they're they're about the only ones doing any business. Uh, mm -hmm. All the you know, restaurants and bars and they're all shut down. So the grocery business is pretty pretty steady and for our stuff. But uh, we got to come back online here pretty soon for sure to start uh, creating the what I call the consumable spirits, not the sanitized. Spirits. Sure, sure. You made this decision. You saw a need. Um, you made the joke that you guys were knuckleheads and just jumped into it. Now, first off, to be able to make hand sanitizer, you have to be able to distill above a certain ABV, correct? I think it's anywhere from, is it 120 up? Yeah, 120 up, yeah, 60 percent uh, alcohol. Up to 95, yeah, is what the FDA um, regulates, yeah. You, when you decided to make this decision and you started doing research of what it would take, what were the, the hurdles that you had to get over to make sure that you weren't going to get in trouble for making a false claim or something like that? First thing I did is I reached out for our state liquor commissioner um, because you're right. They, you know, you, you still have to do things by the book. And so the state of Nebraska was really, really helpful. And they right off the bat came out and said that we're not going to stand in your way. Um, we know there's a need for hand sanitizer. We don't want to be uh, inhibitors. We want to be able to support whatever, you know, you, 
you guys can do. So they locally, statewide, they kind of gave me the green light right away. Um, and it wasn't until maybe a few days later that uh, the TTB came came back and passed the, the current, uh, um, I guess, gave the, yeah, the, yeah. the okay that um, to go ahead and, and do what you need to do to take care of your local community. So, okay. gotcha. uh, which is great. So it, in a way, and I've said this before, it's kind of a, the wild, wild west out there right now. Um, as far as, uh, you know, transporting and whatnot, but at the same time, we, we know it's going to go back to the way it was. So you kind of, you still have to keep good records and, and know what you've, uh, what you've made and what you've, uh, we're not going to be taxed on it, but at the same time, three, four years from now, you know, an auditor is going to come in and they're going to want to take a look and see what you did. Yeah. They'll remember COVID-19, but at the same time, show me how you, you know, document it. And so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of that, but sure. first and foremost, we just really wanted to help our community. And right. I think that that's anybody that's in this industry. The spirit industry is such a small um, community of people that you, you do what it takes to, to help your neighbor. So, mm. yeah, I don't think that, I mean, even me as somebody who's a whiskey educator, it didn't dawn on me all of the little pieces that needed to come together for you guys to be able to produce hand sanitizer. For instance, you guys char are charged an excise tax for uh, the proof gallons that come off your still, right? And you guys needed to get wait until the TP TB said, hey, we're not going to charge you that for anything that's being made in a hand sanitizer. Is that correct? That's correct. So we're still doing it anyway. Uh -huh. uh, we were we were just going about our business, logging everything like we would be taxed on it, but um, so that didn't change, and it really wasn't a uh, a game changer for us. We were still going to do it, and even if we were taxed at a lower rate or taxed at the current rate, right? So yeah, that that's a that's an interesting concept because people may not realize it how many stages of the process producers get taxed and all of that goes into the price that you pay for a bottle out of Kentucky. 60% of what you pay for a bottle goes to the government and various taxes. Only 40% is in the food chain to feed the three tier system. And so, you know, it, it that could have been an impediment and I'm really impressed that the TTB stepped up, got rid of that excise tax to make it more financially feasible because not all distilleries are so financially sound that they could afford to keep paying that excise tax when they're giving the product away. Um, the other thing that you brought up was transport, right? Because normally you're not allowed to throw your product on a, on a truck and drive it to your local grocery store that sells your product, right? Because of the three tier system. And so right now you're saying things are um, a little bit gray area when you're transporting, you know, these spirits to other places. Well, we're not, um, I'll give these guys a chance to talk as well, but we're not selling the hand sanitizer. Mm. Uh, we're donating everything that we are producing. So, um, and the reason for that, quite honestly, is so many people have wanted to reach out and help, whether it's, I can let Dave kind of tackle this because he's dealt with a lot of the calls. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Talk about donations sure yeah everything from uh, financial donations to raw ingredients so um, we've had companies donate corn sugar um, and then everything all the pieces of the puzzle so containers um, you know coming from dairies local dairies that donated one gallon half gallon jugs hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide all the ingredients the compounds um, glycerol um, like Labels to be able to so so the FDA early on put out a guideline for distilleries that were going to convert operations and said that this is here's several options for uh, compounding all of these all these chemicals and um, we chose the most suitable went with that and then they even provide guidelines as to what you have to have on the labels mm. um, gosh what you and, and keep it simple that was pretty much the uh, first rule was 
you know, don't worry about the, the additional um, scents and, and uh, gels and, and you know, carbomers and um, gosh, aloe vera, that sort of stuff. So it, it, it made it a little easier as far as putting it, putting it all together. But um, logistics, all of the um, everything that goes into this has all been donated by, by the community. So the product that you're producing, because I've, I've actually not seen any of the sanitizers produced by any of the local producers, is it a, does it come out as a gel or is it the consistency of like vodka? Yeah. Yeah. It's a liquid liquid. It's liquid. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But if it kills the germs, Oh, it kills the germs for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, um, 170 proof. It's 85 percent alcohol, um, wow. so it's, it's well within that range, 60 to 95 percent. And and the reason for the the liquid aspect versus the gel is we just haven't been able to source any of the gel. Um, Tough, very difficult. So, um, you know, the same the, the liquid aspect of it has worked out really well. For instance, you know supermarkets can now spray their conveyor belts with it with a gel it'd be very difficult right uh the grocery carts um first responders police they can spray down their seats in their vinyl seats their uh, steering wheels and that kind of stuff so the the agent that um that we're using at least to soften up where it's not harmful to your hands is the glycerol okay uh, which is really kind of the key the peroxide obviously will help kill it um and if we get our hands on some gel, we probably would, we would do that as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And one thing, too, you know, with, with the, the, the whole recipe that we have, you know, I would say this is a joke. We're at the VA hospital. My hands have consumed more alcohol than my mouth lately. <laughs> and the thing is, you look at these hands, they're not dry at all. Huh. And, and we use a hand sanitizer all the time. All the time. And you have a, we told this to the state patrol, Nebraska State Patrol yesterday. Look at these hands, how much we're spraying these hands down. They're not drying out. It's a great compound, great recipe, and uh, it's working very well for us. That's awesome. And so let's talk about the, the distribution. Um, well, actually, let's first talk about production. How much hand sanitizer have you all been able to make? So we're approaching 7,000 gallons that we've issued out. Um, wow. 7,000 gallons. That is insane. That is impressive. <laughs> Seven. I believe we're the largest manufacturer of hand sanitizer in the state of Nebraska. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I believe myself the sanitizing king. <laughs> the handy sanity. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. So, uh, oh, 7,000 gallons. Now, when you first started producing the hand sanitizer, who were you distributing to? And how has that changed? So we started with um, the first responders and the medical community. And then we quickly added truck drivers. Uh, we got a lot of truck traffic through here and also require, you know, for supply lines. Um, and then um, gradually we've added grocery stores. They're at the top of the list. Um, and then it, as we've, began to produce more and more and more. We, we did a pretty good smattering across the state to uh, make sure that they've got hand sanitizer. Um, and then as we kind of started to get into the second, third issue of, uh, so some of these hospitals are going through 15, 20 gallons a week, or excuse me, a day. A day. Um, so, you know, we require some pretty large volume. And then uh, we started recently, we, we were approached by the state and the governor's office, Governor Pete Ricketts, um, to be able to provide for grocery stores. So there's a um, foundation, um, I, I, best way to describe it is the, they're kind of like cha like a chamber of commerce for grocery stores in Nebraska gotcha. register and they um, help with, um, you know, scenarios like this. And so uh, we're looking at 400 plus grocery stores. Obviously those are important. Those are about just about the only facilities open. Right. Uh, people alive. Um, but we, any kind of care facilities um, and then on down, not that anybody's less important, but you've got daycares that are providing services for first responders. And so, um, it, you know, on, on down to individuals. So we're actually giving out to the, the community. We've got, uh, we take all requests and then we kind of prioritize them. And then we've got a, a rough algorithm to determine how much volume we'll give to them. Mm. One of the nice things that we've been able to do, well, and 
and Dave and Rich. They've so we've we've uh, and maybe you've talked about this already, but we've uh, uh, signed up with a nonprofit organization here locally, which is the First Responders Foundation, uh, and it's a nonprofit organization that um, helps out first responders in, in needs where maybe their local governments can't fulfill those needs, and so. Uh, whether it's through donations or whatnot, they're able to, to kind of uh, facilitate some of those. And the people there, and, and a couple people in, in particular, when we started doing this, we thought we would just, oh, we'll just do it our, you know, take a take names, and, and it became about overwhelming. Yeah, within within 48 hours, it was like, I was going to about ready to put toothpicks in my eyeballs because it was just <laughs> difficult. To, and so reached out, Dave reached out, and they've been facilitating all the calls, um, and they, you know, it's a, you want to talk about that? Outstanding asset to have. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, covering, uh, you know, they have a lot of connections already, so logistics-wise, um, just being able to connect the dots, and so we've got a couple different missions here, obviously, we're making hand sanitizer, but um, spreading the word, getting the word out, so we've been fortunate enough to um, be in the media spotlight and partnering with um, local politicians, uh, federal, you know, Congressman Don Bacon's been a huge advocate, uh, the mayor of Omaha and in the governor's office, um, can help me connect the dots. Um, we, as we spread the word that we're producing hand sanitizer, you know, they, they help us ensure that we get hand sanitizer into the, the right hands, um, as well as, um, getting the word out that the only way we'd be able to continue to, to do this is, is maintain those donations, the materials. Yeah financial because we do want to sustain production and distribution throughout the, the, the you know the extent of the crisis you yeah. know what's neat is the president and the CEO of that first responders uh, or front foundation there he's a retired two-star general and he said yesterday to us it said man it's neat it's military operation that you know he was a two-star general he was a the commander of a of the a bunch of military people. Yeah. You know, it's like, it was so neat to see you guys step up. You could see this military deal from the Marine Corps, the Army, all of us working together, how we could make this work. But working with that foundation, those guys have done a lot for everybody, the whole community. It's just a, it's a great force multiplier to have. Yeah, that's a great point because it was our Congressman Don Bacon, our local congressman, when we were at the uh, Nebraska State Patrol headquarters, that one thing about veterans – um, and I, and it made a lot of sense, but typically, you know, their, their job is, is to, you know, their, their prior life was to solve problems. Mm -hmm. problems you know, there's a, there's a hill to take, you know, how are we going to take the hill? And that's kind of, I guess, looking back at this, when we started this, I, I really didn't know how we were going to do it. I just knew we were going to, we were going to do it. And mm -hmm. so you, you, you tackle the, the little things as they come, um, which now looking back, it was some, some big hurdles, but you know, you stay around yourself with good people. We can make it happen. You make it happen. Right. So <clears throat> normally whenever you're making, you know, your vodka or whatever, you're cutting out the heads and the tails uh, from your runs. Do you leave that stuff in when you're making the sanitizer just to increase volume? We do. Okay. Yep. And we then, call. and so also, for the public, um, this would not be good to consume like your vodka products. Right. This is non-consumable, not only because of the, the ethanol that's in that, but, you know, you've got glycerol, you've got peroxide. It's, it's not something, it's not going to kill you, but it certainly would give you more than a stomach ache. Sure. So we put it right on the label and not for consumption, for external use only. Yeah, I could just see somebody thinking, eh, it's still in liquid form. It basically looks like they're vodka. I'm, I'm going to take a few squirts. Don't do that, people. <laughs> There's <laughs> other stuff in there. Don't do that. <laughs> well, I tell you, when, when we, we first kicked around the idea of maybe even putting hand sanitizer in, in these canteen bottles, and you know, as we do spitball a lot of ideas, and then somebody suggested pretty quickly, now that would be confusing, misleading. So absolutely, we avoided that. And so now we've We've got uh, very accurate, accurate labels and, um, and, you know, wanted to avoid any of that confusion. Okay. So on an annual basis, um, how many uh, 
barrels of worth of spirit are you guys able to produce? Of spirits? Of spirits, oh, yeah. Spirit. I'm sorry, yeah, not yeah, I'm yeah. trying to get an idea how big your distillery is, and then oh. we'll talk about how much you're able to make in hand sanitizer. So how big is your distillery? How much spirits do you produce per year? Um, so we can usually, I usually go by, you know, weeks. We could do two to three barrels a week. Here. Okay. So kind of gives you an idea, uh, depending on what we make. So we make, we make vodka, we make whiskeys, and we make bourbons. We have uh, 750 gallon big column still, and then we've got some smaller, uh, I call them like craft stills that are 50, 50 gallons that we can do. Um, if we want to use the big still as more of a, um, a cut, a cut type of uh, product and then finish it in the smaller still. So, um, so would you say around 150 barrels a year? Something 120 like to 150. Okay. All right. That's, that's probably about the size of a lot of the craft guys that are here in Texas. Um, about how many barrels do you have aging? Uh, several hundred. Several hundred. And this products that you're releasing now, what age are, are the bourbon products that you're releasing? So we've been open for six years. I've been distilling for close to 16 years. Um, we, we have a six-year-old bourbon that we won a double gold medal for in, in San Francisco back in 2014. Uh, that's kind of been our our go-to brand mm -hmm. uh, we have a uh, high rye which we call a soldier valley private stock that uh, uh, is a 95 percent rye that's a four-year product uh, a little lighter in color obviously due to the high rye and then we have an everyday whiskey which we call our mixer whiskey which is a patriarch whiskey which i i like to tell the story it'll keep it really brief but i launched that um, several years ago to kind of um, go against the, the the fireball craze that right. started. Years ago, I, I introduced that brand for the wholesaler that I re represented, and we couldn't give it away. I mean, we literally could not put it on a sales order and send it in for free. People would want us to pick it up. And I'm, you know, it's free. Well, I don't want it, but it's free, you know? <laughs> and fast forward, you walk into a liquor store and I was in one several years ago and I couldn't swing a dead cat without seeing a 25 to 30 case display at fireball and the the liquor manager store manager who was a friend of mine I was giving him a bunch of grief about it and he was just kind of shaking his head so we came out with we call it uh, kind of a our version of just a, a man yeah, yeah just a, a prohibition style or frontier style Someone that, you know, if you're going to drink it in a shot, you're going to feel it because it's only aged for about 16 months. Yeah. Um, but it's meant to be more of that cold shot, chill shot, or uh, mixed with your favorite soda or whatnot. But that's been, uh, that's been a lot of fun. So. so let's talk a little bit about your brand. So you said you've been in operation for six years? Six years, a little over six years. Okay, okay. And how long, I, I'm always curious about this because you said you were distilling for 16. So you were distilling for 10 years before you started your own brand. And if you're a listener of this podcast, you've been told before that due to the three slash four tier system, it's very difficult for a brand, even if you make the best product in the world, to develop a customer base because the person making the product that's the most passionate that has the biggest incentive to market that product is kind of prohibited from doing so because you can't really sell direct to the public due to the three tier system. And <clears throat> as a result, you rely on a wholesaler and retailers to promote your, your brand for you. And when you're new, you're not a high priority to those entities because they were already in business making money off of other people's products. And so I've often said you kind of have to be a little crazy to want to start a distillery. So tell me about your passion. What made you see that set up and go, I'm doing it? Well, you're, you're right. I mean, my wife 
always would she would say all the time you know I'm the kind of guy would that would get to the cliff jump off the cliff and worry about how I'm gonna land later and that's there's some truth to that I think for a lot of entrepreneurs it's your your mind just kind of works that way again problem solving you want to do something uh, you find a way to do it and yeah there's going to be hurdles to, to jump or overcome but you just take them as they come and you move forward with it so I was lucky enough like I said earlier I was in the wholesale spirit industry um, I was fortunate enough uh, in the position that I was in to be able to travel to meet some pretty neat people uh, some master distillers and was able to work under some other people's uh, licensing uh, in order to kind of get where I was at today. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, and I mean, we're talking in the 90s even, um, being able to lay a barrel or two barrels down a year uh, was something that, and put it away was something that I was I was able to do. So um, a lot of people, when they start out, they don't have that luxury of, and, and again, back in those days, I didn't think that I would have a distillery. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't even crossing my mind. All I knew is I was going to have some pretty cool, kick-ass whiskey that I might be able to uh, put under a name and, and, and just distribute or something down the road. But sure. uh, it's kind of turned into this, and, and it's been a good ride. So, you know, like I said earlier, we're veterans. Um, the bottle, the concept, we have a patent on the um, on the World War II-style canteen bottle, um, which came to me one night just out of the blue and, and was able to um, – get that that patent and so it just kind of came full circle having the name the name goes with my dad's hometown in soldier iowa which is where our water comes from it's in the lust hills of uh of iowa uh, just across the river we're on the river um the missouri river right between Nebraska and iowa and we're about 80 miles away but the lust hills is a very unique set of um area in the world there's only two places in the world that have the soil compound it's, um, Lust Hills in, in the western side of, of Iowa and then also in China. So uh, very distinctful. Water is just fantastic. Um, so that's kind of the whole concept. My dad grew up on that farm and being able to tie in his family uh, farm and, and his community to what we we're all about here as well is, is pretty cool. That's awesome. And so when you started, were, was it like a family operation? And, or was it just all you at first and then you started to add people on later? Did you start off with enough capital that you were able to make some strategic hires right from the beginning? Like how'd all that work? I wish. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know how they always say it takes twice as much money and twice as much time. Well, th that is probably even an understatement. So my wife and I started this, uh, couldn't be more different in people. She came from a, regulatory insurance background where things were black or white. I came from the spirit industry where there's a lot of gray, especially back in some of those days. Um, so we just heard and I started it and Rich was still active military. Uh, I told, I wanted him involved as soon cause he has a marketing degree and he can sell snow to an Eskimo. So it was one of those, uh, it was a no brainer to bring him on. And then uh, our Dave and our, our paths crossed. So, Again, it started as a very small mom and pop type of thing, and, and um, over time we've had to bring on uh, a few investors to kind of help out with some of the things that we wanted to do to expand. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it's still I consider it a very small, intimate group of people that that are part of this. That's well, one thing too is you know going back what, eighteen years ago, eighteen years ago when when Jeff would say, hey, Rich, I'm going on this trip with my business. I'm going to this place or that place, and we're going to Lynchburg, Tennessee. You want to come along with? I'm like, okay, I can learn a little bit about this and you know, see cool places and everything. But he had this drive, Jeff here, had this drive about, hey, you know, wouldn't that be great to, to, to make bourbon in, in Nebraska? And I'm like, well, I don't know, can you make the bourbon in Nebraska? <laughs> you know, he didn't know about this stuff. And he said, oh, this would be so great. And he's got this idea and everything, and then you fast forward it, when he's got this idea, this World War II canteen bottle, and he said, I got this great idea. And I said, holy cow, that's a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it just started really going, and then, you know, he was living here. He lived here. I mean, pretty much it was a little small cabin. It's a little bit different now if you were to take this deal around and show you around. 
But I remember he was living here and I was helping out in the beginning, filling up, you know, canteen bottles and helping out and going to the local Sam's club and, and, and go out and selling for him. And, and he's like, Rich, I, I thank you for doing this. I could throw you a bottle. And I'm like, yeah, hey, that's cool. Whatever, you know, and getting paid. You know, I, I was in the army at the time and then retired. And then this really, it was just neat, but it was just for an entrepreneur, someone that could, that could foresight certain things, look and go, you know, bourbon's going to be hot down the road. It's hot now. It's going to be hot even later. And we got a great concept. But here's one thing, too. This is what sold me. He says, you know, we do this. Every bottle that we sell, we give a portion back to a nonprofit veterans group. And we all know we owe our veterans everything, from our grandparents, you know, to our dads, uncles, aunts, whoever served, we owe our veterans everything. Giving back to our veterans, that's where I said, Jeff, that's huge. That's, 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 that's a big deal. So that's been from the beginning. And as long as we got this thing going, giving back to our veterans, if it's a nonprofit veterans group in, in Oklahoma, in, you know, for a you know, if it's, you know, there's a lot of them. We, we could go to listen. AMVETS. You know, AMVETS. There's yeah. a lot of them given back to, but it, we keep that going. That's a, just an admirable, great thing to do and uh, keep that going. Oh, and one thing too, this is the sand, this is the half gallon hand sanitizer. This is what that package looks like. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Just from the dairy farmers. I actually had the thought because I've been seeing news reports about dairy farmers having to dump milk. Um, because they're, they're, they're not distributing through, you know, restaurants, which was a huge consumer of their products and even farmers that are going to let product or uh, produce rot, right? Like strawberry farmers in California. And a lot of people don't know this, but you could make hand sanitizer out of anything that's got sugar in it. So have you guys worked with any of the local farmers that, lost their distribution of their product, and now they're donating something weird that you're fermenting and turning into hand sanitizer? So locally here, there's, we, you know, we just grow corn. So we're not really <laughs> do a lot of corn and a little bit of wheat and, and, and some soybeans, but uh, none of the, the products that, uh, or that I should say the farmers around our area haven't been impacted like some of the, the dairy farmers in, in mm -hmm. Wisconsin or um, obviously the, the vegetable and fruit farmers around the country. So our, we definitely, our, our hearts go out to some of those people. I know that uh, people aren't traveling as much. So these refineries, these ethanol plants are another thing where they were going 24 seven. Now they're only doing two shifts. Um, so, you know, you see the ethanol prices or the gasoline prices come down. I don't know what it is in Texas, but I think I saw we're like a dollar 30 something here. A yeah. dollar 31 a gallon. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a little lower here. I think because we're closer to the refineries, but it's a little bit lower here. I, I literally went and filled up my wife's car the other day and heard the pump stop and looked at the price and was like, God dang it, it clicked early. And then I looked at how much was in and it was full. I, I, it shocked me, you know? Um, <laughs> so it's, it's. You want to talk about too, Rich brings up a good point. We have a local Kellogg's company here that makes. Um, Frosted Flakes. Yeah, Frosted Flakes, which we all love. Um, <laughs> but they have a byproduct that they're not able to to really do anything with. Um, when it, so it's a it's a syrupy type of a sugar uh, mm -hmm. extract, like a so molasses type thing. Kind of so at, at eighty bricks. Yeah, at eighty bricks. So what we did is we they want they needed the whole thing. They needed some hand sanitizer. So we we kind of hooked them up with that. Um, so they can keep on being safe over there, but they dropped off a tote of, of this. We haven't uh, had a chance to, to do anything with that, but it's going to be interesting to kind of play with that. It's going to be big. Yeah. Well, and same with beer too. So Nebraska Brewing Company donated a couple hundred gallons of beer that for us to be able to ferment and, or distill, excuse me. Yeah. And, and, but, and we haven't quite gotten to that either, but so we're, we're able to do this for a while because of those kinds of donations. Oh, that's amazing. That's a great point. You know, um, so they, there's beer manufacturers out there that without having the restaurants and bars open, a lot of beer going bad. So mm -hmm. we cook off the, um, the CO2 and, and uh, you know, and then we can, I guess, cook that off and go ahead and, 
and add that to our fermentation and, and had some success. So, yeah. That's awesome. So there's a lot of different ways in order to kind of, right now we're not worried about taste. We just want production. Right, <laughs> right. right. It so, doesn't. Uh, right. So, so but, but what, what, if, what if, if, if you stumbled across something that was amazing? Like, like you can make some sort of rum type product out of the Kellogg's it, 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 or whatever, you know what I'm saying? That would be so awesome. I'm pretty excited about that actually because 80 bricks, that's huge. I'm like cinnamon toast crunch hands. Yeah, hands. we're going to really have to, <laughs> you're worried about not having enough bricks. And right. Loot it, you know? To, yeah, you're going to have to cut it before you even cook it or for, you, know, you don't have to cook it, I guess. You just got to ferment it. Yeah. Yeah. So crazy. Uh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So let's talk about your, your regular product sales. So you have a bourbon that's a six-year bourbon that you put in the San Francisco World Spirits Competition, and it won double gold. Is that correct? It did. Okay. Well, I'm going to brag on you for a second so that people know what that means. Okay. So the San Francisco Spirits Competition has world-class judges in it, and I think it, each judge, judging panel is, is it three judges? I think it's each round is three judges, but I, I could be wrong about that part. And <clears throat> all the judges taste the products blind. They only know the category of the spirit. They don't know, um, you know, what it is. So that way they're not influenced by brand. And they have to give it a gold, a silver, a bronze, or a, a this is not good enough for a metal, okay? And <clears throat> so consumers know, Almost everyone who enters, if you pay the fee and you send the bottles, almost everyone gets a medal. Very few spirits get nothing. And those are typically pretty bad, okay? Um, but because of that, getting a bronze is not a big deal because almost everybody at least gets a bronze. But getting double gold means that these extremely experienced tasters, the, only, the way you get double gold is if every judge on the panel all rated it a gold. If even one judge rates it below gold, then the, the vote is what takes place. So if two judges voted a gold and one votes it a silver, then you get gold. If all three judges voted gold, then you get double gold. So in a blind competition with experienced tasters, your product got all the judges to say that it was gold, and that is commendable, and it means something. When someone brags to me that they got bronze at the San Francisco Spirits Competition, I'm like, look, I'm not your average consumer that thinks that means you came in third, okay? All that means is, is that the judges didn't think they were going to be poisoned by your product. Double gold is something, so congratulations. Appreciate Thank that. You. Yeah, you know we're we're pretty proud of that, and uh, we're proud also. I didn't get into this to make vodka. I'll be perfectly honest. I I'm a bourbon and whiskey connoisseur. I have been for years. A huge fan. Um, found I had a pretty decent palate for for whiskeys and bourbons early on, uh, and it wasn't until after we were getting ready to open. And the only way that my banker was going to give me a loan is. He said, you know, we love your, your concept. We love the patent. I, you know, you have the patent on this bottle. We obviously love your product, but we feel like you're going to have a cash flow uh, you know, problem here. We need you to make something that you can have out readily available less than six years. And so at that time, knowing that vodka at that time was still the number one, and it still is the number one category in the world, um, I was going to make a vodka, but I didn't want to make your – the latest and greatest foo foo vodka, peanut butter and jelly vodka, or whatever's out there now. I don't know, but um, something different, something yet, um, something clean. Again, I'm not a vodka drinker, so I, I always kind of work my way backwards. I work on what I, in my head, what I feel like, so, what something should taste like, and then I go and I design the label. So I work myself backwards to the actual product mm -hmm. and I came up with this, our vodka, which is 21% rye. And, um, I found over time with the high percentages of rye, you get that real spicy note and then low percentages of rye tend to kind of mellow some things out. So at a 21% rye um, 
and six times distilled, it really cleaned our vodka up to where there's less than 1% of impurities. Mm -hmm. And so our vodka, fortunate enough, we won a gold medal at the same competition. Um, so again, I don't, it's, it's cool to have some awesome bourbons and whiskeys, but we're pretty proud of our vodka as well for, um, for something that we kind of did as, as a, a secondary type of product, you know? Sure. Sure. Well, and here's my philosophy on vodka. I got myself in trouble in the whiskey community. I guess it was last year. I did a educational piece called Vodka and Why It Sucks. And my point that I was trying to make was that because of the legal definition of vodka, that it must be distilled above 190 proof, that you really can't, it, by law, it's a, a odorless and flavorless spirit. So you can't really tell what it's made from. There actually historically have been vodkas that have been made from cow manure. It doesn't matter what it's made from. Uh, distillation is purification. You're purifying spirit all the way to the point where it's indistinguishable. And so the whole concept of a premium vodka irritates me because it's marketing hype to steal people's hard-earned money. And I just want the people to understand that there's really no such thing as a premium vodka um, and it, since it's not an aged spirit, it's, it's th probably the least expensive thing to produce. Maybe gin's cheaper, I don't know. But um, distilleries need to make it for cash flow reasons, so they're not going to get the loans and the investors that they need because they have no cash flow. But if you're going to buy vodka, I say buy local, right? Because you're supporting a small business, and you're not going to get a product that's significantly different than you get when you go to Total Wine and buy a handle of, ABC vodka, whatever it is, right. uh, because, because molecularly they're pretty much identical. And so it's not that I, and I also talked a little bit in the piece about how the introduction and growth of vodka, the vodka category did a lot of damage to the bourbon industry in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, no, that, and, and that if you're a bourbon lover, you need to acknowledge that and support your bourbon brands and maybe shy away from the vodka since they hurt us so bad so, so much in the past. And people got really upset about that, which I was surprised because it was only published in whiskey groups. Uh, but yeah, that's my philosophy. You know, if you, if you make a good, clean vodka, um, you know, I'd rather drink a, a good, clean vodka from a small producer that's using that revenue to push their whiskey brands forward than I would to go drink some nameless, faceless vodka that's just GNS that they bought from, you know, probably MGPI and then watered it down and put a fancy label on it. You know what I mean? That, that's kind of my philosophy. Tell me where your products are currently distributed. So we're in uh, the Midwest, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Colorado. So we're with the wholesaler, uh, wholesalers there, RNDC, Republic National Distributing Company. Um, and then we're also in Navy Exchange, Navy and Marine Corps exchanges. Um, we have been in Army Air Force exchanges. Uh, it's hit and miss right now. Uh, and we'd like to be back there permanently because we're, we're made for the military, obviously, just because right. of our packaging and whatnot. But uh, um, So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, we're also selling a little bit online with some uh, online stores. Um, but hopefully, you know, we've had lots of requests from different parts of the country around the world, but it just takes time. As you know, it just takes a lot of having that three tier. Every state's a little different. You got to go in and, and you got to have marketing money behind you. We're big believers here too, that you have to have a really strong foundation. And we've been kind of taking care of our foundation and, and strategically planning uh, to, to spread out a little bit. So, um, it's still a work in progress, but that's kind of where our story is, where we're at. And what, what's the short range and, and long range goal? Do you have plans in the immediate future to open up to new markets? Um, do you have plans to increase your you know, capacity? Do you want to stay in this location? All that stuff. Great questions crickets <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that <laughs> yes to everything long-term plans are I'd like to get big enough to where we would be able to maybe sell to a conglomerate that there's value there to somebody um, and what would I do then 
we've talked about it. We, I still want to be involved with veterans groups and be some type of philanthropist and help in veterans causes. Um, until that happens, or even if it doesn't happen, we definitely want to expand, be able to go into Texas, want to go into Florida, Arizona. You know, these are states that are highly um, retired, military retired friendly. So we want to go into those states. Um, we definitely want to be on the shelf every day at, at AFES, uh, the Army Air Force Exchanges. But you got to have a, a SASRAC background, or you got to have a Brown Foreman background, or a Diageo background to be able to seem like you to play in that arena um, on a national scale when those buyers and, and you know they, they're looking at national numbers of and we're just not there so it, we're not at the, the forefront where they're looking at us to see even though we sold out of everything we've ever sold um, rich went to every one of those locations and sold the product we just haven't been able to get a reorder on that so there's some there's definitely some obstacles um, that we need to overcome and, uh, you know, hopefully we can do that. So, all right. Well, is there anything else that we need to cover before we hop off? Um, it's gotta be something. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to throw this out. We've been working as we said in the beginning, some crazy hours here. Ding to dong. And I'm like, is it Wednesday or Tuesday? <laughs> uh, but Thursday. it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> this is the quietest. We're very active. We're, I mean, you see our videos and everything. I'm sitting here going, man, did I get my sleep last night? <laughs> I mean, wonder if Tony's down there mixing up stuff. wonder if the uh, – because we just had the uh, – here in Omaha, there's Sarpy County, there's Douglas County. We just had a, a Sarpy County Sheriff's Department pick up some more stuff. I want to see those guys. But it's funny is, gosh, we, we've been working. Well, this is the, probably the longest the three of us have sat down together. Oh, in yeah. Weeks. Yeah, and the closest, too. You know, yeah. That's, that's the other thing, too, is with all of the – so we've been putting in extra time you know, bottling and labeling all of the hand sanitizer. We've been getting a ton of requests. People want to come in and, and help. But so you can't all, let them. We can't let them because of the social distancing. Yeah, so it's, it all falls on but everybody this, here. This fight we're in, you know, we're all in. Yeah. When it comes down to that hand sanitizer and then the whole thing with the Soldier Valley brand, you know, we've got a great – base of people that love us they love the whole thing with the veterans and uh, it just continues to grow with this whole thing that we're doing with this first response i mean Talk about six. Uh, seven yeah six. you know the, the soldier valley spirits.com that's it you know the six it's still six times vodka you, usually our shirts we have a six on there it's still six times vodka age six year bourbon and we got your six we got your back the enemy in the military, in the infantry or any military deal, the enemy is always at your 12 o'clock position. Your six is your back. I got your six. When it comes down to this hand sanitizer, when it comes down to giving back to veterans with this organization, we got your six. All right, guys. Well, uh, we'll, we'll leave it with that. Um, and to the listening audience out there, thank you for tuning in. And you can get more information about Bourbon Real Talk by going to bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, forward slash bourbonrealtalk. You can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast player. And we would love it if you would subscribe, like, and review, because that helps the podcast get exposed to new listeners. And if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk.